I wanted to tell you a little bit about dogs this evening, but from a kind of different perspective. It's just some stuff that we've been working on recently where we saw a lot of correlations between things and it was just fun to try and catalog it all. And so I thought I'd give you some overall perspective and kind of what we're thinking about when it comes to dogs and people. Um, back in, um, in 1998, a woman named Lynn Margulis, who had a, a glowing and, and pretty phenomenal research career, wrote this book where she really came to this conclusion where she says the quote of this, of the kind of the theme of her entire book is that the tendency, she says, of, quote, independent life is to bind together and to reemerge. And by that, she means that there are lots of organisms that, organisms that you can think that are constantly creating relationships with one another and are, or are commensal with one another in some way or symbiotic in some way. And that a lot of times this results in new traits in both of those organisms. And that as a result, they're kind of thought of as a, as a single unit or they become so interdependent upon one another that it's hard to think of them as anything other than um, the, the two of them together becomes the characteristic that most defines each of them. And this happens all the time in our life as well. I mean, with respect to everything. And then the general pattern, goes something like this. You are, as an individual, aware of something uh, that becomes into your field of view or your life experience. And if you don't necessarily avoid it at start, you at least tolerate it. You might not be necessarily attracted to it, but you're just aware and it's there and, you know, it's not fine. Then you start maybe a relationship that is facultative, or which is a fancy biology word meaning sort of optional. You can take part in it or you cannot. It doesn't really matter. You become a little bit more reliant on it, reliant on it perhaps a little bit later. And then finally, you end up in this kind of weird situation where you are mutually obligate symbionts. Uh, another word for that in, in human relationships would be codependency, is that you cannot survive without it and that everything else ceases to matter. And that if you were to remove it, you would as an individual cease to exist. And one analogy that I was thinking of with this has a lot to do with the technology. Um, I'm old enough to remember a time before cell phones or before mobile phones. And when they first started coming onto the scene, I even explicitly remember being told, like, if you had one or there was maybe one, it was just in the car and it was just for emergencies, in which case you have a very, you're kind of aware of it. Maybe other people have them. They famously feature in films like Wall Street as a signifier of wealth and, you know, like power and whatever else. But most people don't really have them. And if you do, you're not dependent on them by any stretch. You're using them just because they fill a particular role at a particular time. Then time moves forward and more of your friends get them and they become more common. And then you start using them, not just for emergencies, you start actually calling people with them. And then over time, the screens get bigger, they start to go to color. And now you're not just calling, you're texting people. And so you're communicating in a different way. And then you can start getting the internet. Then you start getting email. And now your company's telling you that you have to have one through them because you have to be accessible at all times of the day. And now you're filming videos and putting them up on YouTube or TikTok or a million other things. And the imagination of people to Think that they could now live their life without a phone is just absurd where 15 years ago nobody had one now if you don't have one it's absolutely essential and so you go through this whole pattern of awareness to co complete codependency and it kind of sneaks up on you nobody ever intended to be wholly reliant upon a phone and yet here we are all of us completely 100 reliant upon our phones so when we think about the relationships that we have with each other they follow off in a very similar pattern that we would recognize with our relationships with, with technology. So perhaps you go on a first date and you are there and you kind of meet and you maybe share maybe a cup of coffee. There's not really not much there, but you've got to smile. Then that goes well enough. It's kind of still facultative, but maybe now you share a glass of wine and now you're out and you're having a good time and you're spending, you're spending more of your time together. So much so that perhaps you are now sharing a meal and you're sharing saliva and you're sharing bites of things together and you find, you find yourself becoming increasingly close to another human being up until the point that it goes particularly well, you're sharing all kinds of things that we won't necessarily have to talk about, but there's lots of other things about your life that you can share. And if this goes particularly well, well, then perhaps you're sharing a house. You have one abode, you have one address, you have one place that people know to come and have a party, and then things go well enough. You've also got one mortgage. You also have one joint bank account. So yes, there's two cards there, each signifying you as an individual, but they're the same color, the same shape, and they've got all the same numbers on. So this is all part of this thing where you start off as independent and you combine to form one entity, which gets recognized as such. And maybe if you go far enough along the line, you get a dog as well. And a dog in this particular way is a demonstration to a lot of people that you are now one thing. And that you, the dog represents all of the other things that came together. Be, I mean, maybe you can get one on your own, sure, but more often than not, certainly around my house, um, everybody who's got kids now has a dog, and it becomes sort of this unit of the family unit becomes enhanced or exaggerated by the presence or the ownership of a dog. So 
again, we come back to Lynn Margulis, the tendency of independent life is to bind together and to reemerge. And I think a lot of our language even reflects this. If you get, if you stay together so long that you become one thing, we start to refer to those things as one thing. So I don't know how many of you will recognize this couple. Uh, lots of people are very excited because they've recently gotten back together. This is Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck. And how are they referred to in the press and in the tabloids and whatever else? It's not Jennifer Lopez and Ben Affleck. No, it's Benefer. Of course it is. It's benefit because you want one word to signify that the two of them are a single unit. This is a couple that is now bounded. Once again, they might break up again. But if for the time being, we have this nice bubble where you can apply a single word to represent two people. So when we think about this, then how do we think about dogs? What are dogs actually? When we so the rest of this talk, what I'd like to do is explore this idea of dogs being an emergent thing that comes about as a result of our relationship with wolves. In fact, that's how I would actually describe dogs. It's not something that we necessarily grabbed a puppy in a cave, a wolf puppy in a cave, and forced it to be a dog. Very much like your cell phone ownership, I think what happened is if you get a bunch of people together and you get wolves close together and the two of them start forming this relationship, they go on the date, they have the coffee, they have the wine, they have the house, they have the mortgage, whatever else, those two things suddenly start to become more as one thing. And so the benefer in the human sense becomes dog in the, the canid sense. So that dogs are simply the manifestation of the relationship that humans and wolves had over whatever period of time and wherever in the world and however long ago it took place, dogs are this emergent entity that is the result purely of this closening of the relationship. And if you have a relationship, then you can think of the relationship in terms of what do we share? We can go through that list again of what we talked about with people, but so then what do we share with dogs? And how do we recognize that relationship and those sharing of those characteristics in the biological record, in the archeological record, in the anthropological literature? How do we try and manage to figure out when the time and place was that this relationship started to come about and what ways do we recognize it as such? So here's a series of different categories in which that might be true. Let's start with diet. So if you are two independent people and you're going on a first date, the likelihood is you haven't had every meal together. The more time that you spend with someone else, the more likely it is you're gonna be sharing meals. It's just more efficient that way. One person cooks or both people cook and then you start eating together, which means that all of the ingredients and then all of the intake for that are going to be mirrored in both of your bodies. And the way that we can see this archeologically is through this thing called isotopes. So there are, through both carbon and nitrogen, there are ways to look at the proportions of those two isotopes in your bones or in your skeleton or your skin or in your hair or whatever else. And those two are reflective of the diet that you've got. So that if you have the same values of what is called delta N and delta C and the combination of those two, the more likely you are to be eating the same kinds of things because you are what you eat. And in this paper that came out about a little over 10 years ago or so, what they found was that the isotopic fractions of delta N and delta C in human bone were virtually identical to those of the dogs that they found. And that's pretty interesting because that would that suggests that if the dog bones and the human bones are showing you the same isotopic signatures, that's telling you they're eating the same things for a long enough period of time to be able to reflect that signature in their bones. And so the authors of this paper referred to dogs, especially in this context, as domestic symbioses meaning that there was this symbioticness between the two that was reflected in the diet that they were sharing. Now, you're not going to have the same diet as a wolf, which is you're no not close to, they're eating something very different than you. So you can maybe, if you can start to measure the difference in the carbon and the nitrogen between you and the dogs, you might then be able to say when this relationship started to really emerge because we're spending more and more time together. It turns out that this was just one site in the Neolithic in China, but if you look through time, there is this particular uh, graph where you look at the, the delta, just the delta N, the, the nitrogen, which is reflecting the amount of animal protein in your diet. And what's really fun about this is that for most of the time, humans have a slightly higher delta N than the dogs do. But what's curious about this is they shift in unison. So even if they're not smack on top of each other, when the humans go down, the dogs are going down. When the humans go up, the dogs are going up. And again, this suggests, this parallel movement suggests that those two species are spending much more time together and are therefore being, and that's reflected in a, a through time archaeological perspective. So when you think about what you had, I mean, this is a great time of year to be talking about this, maybe just slightly falling out. We have this really 
interesting idea that what we feed ourselves, we want to be feeding those things that are closest to us. That might be your partner, but it also might be those animals that you're sharing your space with. So perhaps this morning you went out and were feeling a bit thirsty and needed some caffeine. What did you have? You probably had a pumpkin spice latte. They're being offered and it used to be a Starbucks only thing. Now it's everywhere else. And it will not surprise you that there are multiple firms, including this particular one, that allow you to buy pumpkin spice lattes for your dogs. This is an actual product sold by an actual company. These are oven baked dog biscuits and it says pumpkin and spice five flavored lattes and it's you know free of all kinds of other things it's got the little psl on there and you feel better about feeding your dog the same thing that you're eating now is this a good idea for your dog no clearly not but are you going to do it anyway absolutely because there's something about feeding animals that makes you feel good especially if they're eating the same thing that you are because it's reflective of that shared space that shared relationship that you have so that's diet how about evolutionary adaptation. If dogs and humans are sharing the same space and they both meet unique challenges, maybe they are meeting those evolutionary challenges using the same strategies in exactly the same ways. So if we, there's this fascinating paper out uh, a number of years, a couple of years ago now, where they looked at the genomes of human beings, uh, human cultures who were living high on the Tibetan plateau. And what they found was that people who were living up there had a version of this gene called EPAS1 which is just a gene and what it allows you to do is to retain oxygen at a greater proportion so that when you are breathing at 4000 meters your blood alcohol or your blood alcohol your blood um, oxygen levels are high enough to be able to allow you to run to carry a pregnancy to term to do all kinds of things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do because if you don't have this version of the gene you can live at sea level but the higher up you go the more you get the altitude headaches the more you're just incapable of living at very high altitudes and the weird thing is that basically the entire human population lacks this variant that allows you to live at high altitude so the question is did they evolve this on their own or did they acquire this through admixture with some other species and it turns out it's the latter and what's fascinating about this is that all the people living on the Tibetan plateau, or the vast majority of them anyway, have this version of EPAS-1 that their ancestors got from Denisovans, which is this archaic um, uh, ancestor of our archaic lineage of human beings that lived a long time ago and went extinct a long time ago, but had plenty of opportunity and did actually hybridize with lots of human lineages. And in that process, humans managed to get this EPAS-1 gene, looks like that took place at lower altitudes, but that gave them the toolkit that they needed to survive at higher altitudes, which is just fascinating. Except, and it gets even crazier because when we think about dogs, what we found is that the dogs that are living also on the Tibetan plateau, in this case, the Tibetan Mastiffs, also have a version of exactly the same gene, EPAS-1, that allows them to survive at high, high altitudes. And they got that, non, again, not through evolving it independently and altering the shape of that gene to allow them to, to breathe very thin oxygen at high altitudes. Instead, what did they do? They got EPAS-1 from a gray wolf that was indigenous to that region and that itself had been able to evolve this EPAS-1. So the dogs are getting it through by borrowing it from a very closely related species. The people are getting it by borrowing it from a closely related species. And both of them then, the dogs and the people who have no business living at 4,000 meters are able to do so through that evolutionary um, strategy of mating with something else that's got it rather than having to do it all by yourself. How about them uh, in representation, in art, in aesthetics, and how we think about dogs? And we can see that people have had a very close relationship with dogs in the way that they represent both dogs and people in the archaeological and, um, and a variety of other records, including this concept of cynocephaly, where you show a human form with a dog head, cynocephaly, and this, this, these things called telkines, which I only learned about relatively recently which come from Greek mythology and were the original in Greek mythology, the original inhabitants of the islands of Rhodes. Before people got there in Greek mythology, it was all human bodies with dog heads. This is just how it worked. And again, this is reflective of this idea that we are our dogs and therefore we share our physical forms. And you might have a dog head, but a human body. And so therefore it's this kind of merging of those two worlds where they cease to become distinct entities and are kind of forced together and smashed into one single thing that is then nicely artistically demonstrated by this thing that's got a giant hammer or something. How about this idea that people say, oh, well, you have a dog and you either pick a dog that looks like you or over a not long enough period of time, you start to become your dog and you start to look like your dog. Again, becoming this one entity like Lynn, Mar Lynn Margulis was suggesting. Well, we have some very nice medieval portraits here when you can, I think you can agree that this gentleman looks quite a bit like his dog, which is kind of fun. And then this dog, weirdly, looks quite a bit like his gentleman. That's just how it's, we see this all the time. And we can think of it as kind of, well, it's anecdotal. It's just a nice fun joke to say, and people kind of see it enough to kind of recognize the true thing, but it's not really a real thing. 
Is it? Sure, it's not a real thing, except there, yes, it is. It's a real thing. People study this and they can do statistical tests on this. So what they did was they took, they took pictures of people and dogs and they showed it to other people who didn't know the dogs, didn't know the people. And they said, put the dogs and the people together that you think own them. And they did so at a much greater uh, rate than chance than you would expect, demonstrating that yes, and their conclusion was that these results provide evidence for the popular belief that there is in fact a physical resemblance between dogs and their owners. Now, why or how that's coming about is interesting, but the fact is it's a real phenomenon. And that there is again, this idea that you were kind of merging as one, that if your dog represents you aesthetically and you represent your dog as such, then that's kind of a demonstration of this very close relationship that you've knitted together. Well, how about, uh, we talked about adaptation. How about evolutionary dispersal and, and evolutionary dispersal history for that matter? Are dogs and people moving around the world together and what evidence do we have of that? Well, yeah, probably, but let's see what the evidence is. So this is an artistic rendering of what is supposed to be one of the very first people to enter into the uh, into North America, coming across the Bering Land Bridge up in Siberia. And they are doing so, you will notice, they are uh, uh, first running into horses, which of course evolved in North America before coming west into Eurasia. And there's a mammoth there on the horizon. There's some bison there, of course, on the plane. And next to this person is, not surprisingly, a dog. So it's a nice representation of what, how we think the people first got to North America. So we did a study where we looked at the genetics first of dogs, and we looked at just the mitochondrial element of dogs, not looking at the, the, the nuclear genome, but looking at the mitochondrial genome, which is a bit smaller, evolves a bit faster, and is a bit easier to analyze, frankly. And so what we did was we looked at a whole bunch of different dogs across the world, and we built these kinds of trees from them, and then used those trees to perform a molecular clock analysis to try and give us a time frame over which the branches on this tree were splitting off from each other. And the first thing that we noticed was that all the dogs in the North America that were there prior to European contact were all here on this right hand side. And there were four separate lineages that all coalesced or came back together at a single node or a single point on the branching of the tree there. And so this took place Sorry. Um, so they all came back together right there at a time when you have all four lineages, and we can use that molecular clock analysis to come up with a time for it, which was about 15,000 or so, so 15,000 years ago, which fits generally with a lot of models of how people first got into North America. Then completely independently, we had we put the dogs to one side. We then focused on the people. We got a whole bunch of human mitochondrial genomes from both ancient and modern humans, again, from the Americas and from Eurasia and from everywhere else. We built a tree which has some similarities to the dog tree. And the one thing that we found, which is really pretty interesting, could be coincidental, but perhaps not, was that just like the dogs with having four lineages, we also found four lineages that were exclusively in the Americas. And they too coalesced to a single point right there, which when we put a molecular clock analysis on it, again, completely independent of the dog one, came up to rather than 15,000, 15 and a half thousand. Of course, there's big, reasonably large error bars on these estimates, but both of those things were, it looked like they were happening at exactly the same time. What's fun then, if we can layer them on top of each other and just have the time be the one consistent thing between the two of them, and we can see a series of points on those trees when we know that different populations were present in different parts of, the, of, the, of North America and of Eurasia, and when we know different populations were splitting from each other, we then can put a little window of time over the two of them just together like that, and they are per per perfectly symmetrical, which is suggesting that those four lineages that we see both in dogs and people is not a coincidence and that they likely came in at exactly the same time with each other and then followed the same routes as they entered the Americas with dogs alongside people the entire time. Which begs the question, did people not enter the Americas before that because they didn't have dogs? In other words, how necessary were dogs for people to get into the Americas? In which case, this is now a really thing, Lynn Margulis's point is absolutely right, merging together to form one entity that each one on its own wouldn't have done so, but together they're allowed to do so, and that forms this kind of interesting idea. So we think that there's probably more to this. We can flesh this out by following each one of those four different lineages and people and dogs and kind of make uh, a more detailed survey of this to try and understand were those four actually separate, where we have separate individual smaller lineages with dogs and people going to the West Coast, the East Coast, down south into Mexico and further into South America. How then about demographic history, population size, do those things very much like the dietary isotopes that we were looking at go up and down in unison. How about the demography? Does it go up and down at the same time and in the same direction and the same magnitude? Well, there's a very easy test of that. And we looked at this as well. There's a, a, a 
pretty devastating but fascinating paper uh, out relatively recently looking at what happened when Europeans first arrived in the Americas in the very late 15th century. And from their estimates, using a whole bunch of different models and looking at the archaeology and a whole series of other things, they quoted in their uh, in their paper, they came up with this idea that 55 million indigenous people died following the European conquest of the Americas beginning in 1492, and the vast majority of those died without Europeans ever seeing them in the first place. The spread of disease, very much like what we're seeing with COVID, just whipped through this population, and that's why when a lot of Europeans finally got into the interior of the Americas, they were like, this is uninhabited. Same thing happened on Easter Island. The first time anybody started making any real um, notes of what was left on the island it was very very few people and that's because the initial boats that came spread the diseases out and just knocked out tens of millions of people and leaving the, the continent basically uninhabited before the rest of the Europeans started to come in so we know that's what happened with the people that's pretty clear what's happening with the dogs we know dogs were there we know they arrived at the same time as people we know we're traveling the same routes as we've just discussed and we published a paper a couple of years ago where we looked at the ancient DNA of the American dogs, both North and South America, than what their genetic signatures were prior to the arrival of the Europeans. And what we found was that the majority, the vast majority, in fact, of the modern American dog population, including multiple what we were called native breeds, things like Chihuahuas, uh, things like Sholos, things like Carolina, um, Carolina dogs, all of those dogs, which are supposed to have a very deep history, none of them and none of the rest of the dogs either possessed any detectable traces of ancient American dog ancestry which suggests that as those diseases were wiping out people, exactly the same thing was happening to dogs. We know that dogs were also culturally persecuted. We know that they were um, out of fashion. There was all kinds of reasons. They were no, hit on the head for a variety of reasons as well. So we know that the, what, the dog population, was, which was sizable in the Americas, that were completely distinct from any other dog population on the world at that point, just like the people, had a very similar demographic decline as soon as the Europeans set foot in North and South America. So again, parallel evolutionary trajectories between these two things. And of course they do because they're so linked together. How about things like lifestyle? And what I've referred to here is death style. Do we live and die in the same way as our dogs? And it won't surprise you to know that this actually gets manifested in some really pretty fascinating ways. I found this paper just last night when I was putting this talk together, um, where people looked at people's weight in houses and they measured their weight by, through BMI, the body mass index, and they correlated that body mass index with whether or not their pet dogs were obese. And it will not surprise you to learn that we found a significant relationship between the degree of overweight of dogs and the BMI of their owners. In other words, if you are a person who has a high BMI and is classified as either obese or something near that, the likely is if you have a dog, that dog is likely to be in the same thing. And that goes back to the pumpkin spice latte thing as well. If you are sharing a house with someone, you are likely eating the same things, you are employing the same strategies, having the same ideas around food, and you those two things come together, even though, of course, dogs and humans don't share a common evolutionary ancestor for at least 60, 65 million years or something to that degree. So maybe we shouldn't be eating the same things, but we kind of prefer that our dogs do because it's a reflection of who we are. So that's how we live. How do we die? Well, there's this fascinating paper by Eric Turigny that just came out about a year ago. He's at Newcastle, and he went around to all of the pet cemeteries and explicitly the Victorian dog cemeteries and made a note of everything that you could about these things, like the, the gravestones themselves, the area around the gravestones, and also what's written on the gravestones. And what's fascinating is that he can see this real trajectory of a changing relationship and the expression of that relationship that people have had with their dogs over the last century or century and a half or so. And what's fascinating about it is that at the beginning, or sorry, in late 19th century, early 20th century, the, the understood dog moat was that animals do not have souls. And therefore, if you're gonna bury your dog, which is already a little bit sketchy, especially if you're gonna do it on its own, you cannot make any reference to heaven. You are not gonna see your dog in heaven because dogs don't have souls and can't enter heaven. So there is no mention of this, but people you can see over a couple of decades start forming relationships with dogs in their homes that mirror the ones that they have with their offspring, with their siblings, with their parents. And so they see the dogs as members of their family and they want to express that in the dog's death just as they've done in life. And so you can see these words creeping in. So very slowly people start saying, we will see you on the other side or making kind of vague allusions to this idea that whether or not dogs have souls or not, they want the idea of being able to see them when they die as well because they meant so much to them when they were alive. And that I think is a really telling demonstration and a kind of great signal that comes through that reveals that the, the, the degree and the intensity of that relationship. 
So let's go back here again. We have the awareness. We are aware of the wolves. We have the avoidance of the wolves. The wolves are likely avoiding us. There's the tolerance of the wolves and the people. They're eh, kind of there. Then it's maybe optional. Maybe the wolves are taking advantage of some of the waste products in the human moving camp and maybe vice versa. Then there's the kind of semi-reliance. Maybe wolves start acting as sentries. Maybe they start acting as hunting partners. Then they become mutual obligate symbiotes where now there are human populations who are employing life ways that could not exist if they did not have dogs. And they are expressing that by burying their dogs uh, in graves where the grave goods are just as intense as they would another human being. And they become full important members of that society. And you do have this very strict codependency between the two of them. This is what I think is happening. And so let's think then about that shared space and what other things those two things might be sharing. You're sharing, these two are sharing a coffee. Let's say it's their first coffee. What are they sharing? Probably not a whole lot. They're not doing laundry in the same place. They're not eating the same foods. They might be enjoying each other's company here. But if this is a first date, if you were to look at any of the signatures and their bones, their hair or anything else, you probably wouldn't be seeing a lot of overlap between them. These two, well, it looks to me like the two glasses of wine that they're sharing are probably from the same bottle, in which case, maybe they've spent a little bit more time together. They're certainly breathing the same air a little bit more closely together here. Maybe they're kind of, when they're speaking, there's a little bit of spittle going back and forth or something like this. So maybe there's a few microbes back and forth again. And these two, well, certainly they're sharing their entire oral microbiomes are now being shared, right? You're looking off the same spoon. So you're swapping all kinds of stuff back and forth. And these two, we don't even have to go into it. But yeah, there's a lot more sharing going on in here. And what are we referring to explicitly? microbes. Absolutely, right? There are all kinds of zoonoses, of microbes, of very small things that do not transfer between any two organisms until you get very close together. So is that true of dogs and human beings? To what degree are we sharing our microbial universes as well? Will not surprise you to know that that's absolutely what's happening. So in this paper about cohabitating family members share microbiota with one another and their dogs, they, are, they concluded that dog ownership significantly increased the shared skin microbiota, meaning the entire um, kind of ecosystem of bacteria that live on your skin in cohabitating adults and dog owning adults shared more skin microbiota with their own dogs than with other dogs. So the dogs themselves are so different from each other at this point that you, the dog is effectively a human being and vice versa. You are constantly in, in contact with your dog. You're probably putting a nice jacket on it because it's only three degrees outside. You're holding it perpetually. You're letting it to lick your face. You are constantly sharing this entire universe of microbiota all over your skin and, and maybe elsewhere. How about allergies? Yes, it turns out those are shared too. So in this particular paper, they found that dog owner pairs suffered simultaneously from allergic traits, especially in an urban environment that homogenized both dog and human skin microbiota. So if you are sharing the same microbiota, you're going to be subjected to the same kinds of things. You're going to have the same reaction, in many cases, an allergic reaction to whatever it is that's causing that allergic reaction in the first place. So by sharing all of the space and by sharing everything else, you are now the downstream effect is that you're going to be sharing the same colds, the same allerg allergies and whatever else. And then, of course, how about bacterial and viral zoonotic infections like COVID? This we know that there's a lot, the closer and people are spending, the more time people are spending with animals and vice versa, the more they're sharing a lot of zoonoses back and forth. That's probably the origins of TB, although which direction it's going is a big question mark. Um, plague and COVID and all these things, we know that COVID is whipping through zoos at the moment, for example. Like we, we share these things with when we have very close contact with them. So this is a little bit long, but I wanted to get the point across here was that. The quote here is that viral infections, rabies, norovirus, bacteria, pastorella, salmonella, brucella, yersinia, campylobacter, uh, bordetella, coxia, all these classic ones, leptospirilla, staphylococcus intermediates, and mephilis, and, um, are the most common viral and bacterial zoonotic infections transmitted to humans by dogs and likely vice versa as well. And this list is not small. In fact, I don't know what's not on this list. Basically anything that you can get, you're gonna to pass to your dog and vice versa. And be, again, reflective of that ridiculously shared space, that close relationship and that idea that they are us and we are them. So what are dogs? Well, dogs really are this emergent phenomena that comes about as a result as people and wolves start forming closer relationships. And the dog is the necessary and emergent fact factor of that relationship. And that we've gone from kind of being wary of one another to now simply one, we are benefit with our dogs and we are mutually obligate symbionts. And we reflect that through things on, on our online life. So on Instagram, what are you taking pictures of? Your people? No, you're taking pictures of your dog the whole time. You're dressing them up like you. You put them onto Christmas jumpers. You do all these things. You treat them as members of the family. And less like Lynn Margulis said, the tendency of independent life is to bind together and reemerge. And in that way, as soon as it becomes completely 
encapsulated as a single thing, it's hard to imagine how it emerged in the first place because it seems so perfect. And, and I, what I love about this image is that this dog looks as though it has emerged fully formed from this carpet from which it seems like it's got exactly the same coat. And I don't think that that's an accident, right? I think people are, they're all both soft and they're fun to pet. So yeah, as your carpet and your dog are probably gonna look very similar after a little while. So I don't think that we should be embarrassed by this. I don't think that it's something to be worried about, but I do think it's, an, it's a fascinating and interesting reflection on this idea of what dogs are. And that in fact, I think we should probably celebrate this because dogs occupy a lot of different niches and have, fill a lot of different roles and have done for such a long time that if you have a dog and you are expressing that love for that dog and that emergence and the way in which that dog fits into your life in any way, then you know that you are carrying on a tradition that has been around for at least 15,000 years and maybe 25,000 years. And that this has become such an indelible part of our species that we have finally merged so significantly with another species to have effectively become one. Thank you very much.